Hello, this is Lynn Fraser with the Killaby Center for Recovery. I'm here today with Durga Leela, who's a fascinating person who brings in Ayurveda, yoga, and a long tradition of practice into her work with addiction. I'm going to get you to introduce yourself, Durga. And to start with, maybe you could tell us a little bit of your story and how you got into this kind of work. Thank you, Lynn. I'm really glad to be part of this summit. Um, Scott and I and a few others were down in the Bahamas ashram on the recovery symposium that we offer there every year. Um, so I was really glad to hear more about his work and this summit in particular, which is of great value to people. Um, so how did I start yoga recovery? Uh, I had always practiced Hatha yoga since my mid twenties. Um, and I was uh, practicing an alcoholic at that stage. Ah. And I um, lost my mother. Um, when I was 32 and uh, I say to alcoholism, not everybody in my family agrees with that, which is mm -hmm. the nature of this disease. Right. And um, I guess I was heartbroken and I had a fallout myself. Like I was no longer able to show up for my life, my job, um, partly due to the grief, but also the, the act of alcoholism within me had got worse. And so I did a nice geographic over from London to Lake Tahoe. And um, nine months after I moved there, I got sober through the 12-step um, program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, an incredible experience. Um, you know, I was a reluctant member, but I really had nowhere else to go. Um, and I was going through early sobriety and I guess I quickly became aware of the underlying issues, you know, the issues underneath the drinking problem. Cause I was, I was really lucky that the drinking problem seemed to have just been removed almost. It felt like overnight, uh -huh. but I had to kind of come back and emerge into a life that I was to, to live, you know, without these crutches. Um, so doing the spiritual work of the 12 steps, it was very, very foundational for me. And I continued to do Hatha yoga as a practice and that really helped me. And then it came to the time, I, I went into therapy also um, in early recovery. And then it came to the time where my therapist had asked me to see a psychiatrist because he wanted me to perhaps consider medication for what he thought was some form of depression. And around then I was about 18 months sober. And so I, I mentioned to my therapist that I thought maybe I shouldn't be medicated until I gave up smoking. So I'm an asthmatic that had a 15 to 20 a day habit of cigarettes. Oh. So sometimes I would take a puff on my inhaler and then light up a cigarette and then finish the cigarette with another puff on the inhaler. And I knew, especially having moved to Lake Tahoe, I knew that this wasn't exactly the life that I had aspired to. Right. And so it was, it was a deathly addiction that I had and I couldn't see a way to deal with it. But my therapist kind of said, well, I do want you to see this psychiatrist. So I'm not going to see you next week. So if you smoke about 15 a day, cut one out per day. And by the time I see you in two weeks time, you'll be a non-smoker and we can move ahead. He also said that it wasn't really a big issue that I would, I continued to smoke. It might be better that we just get me medicated. Um, and I really fundamentally didn't really believe that, you know, I thought smoking and the effects it had on me um, with the background of asthma was really contributing to my lack of energy and um, kind of fog. I was still somewhat in a fog about what I was going to do with my life. Um, so a friend recommended that I go down to an ashram as a smoke and rehab. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And I went, I went back to that ashram very quickly afterwards because I wanted to hear more about this science of Ayurveda that I had just been introduced to. And I heard my second talk on Ayurveda from Mark Halpern, who runs the California College of Ayurveda. And I just had this eureka moment. That's what I needed to do. Um, I needed to study Ayurveda specifically to bring it to people with addictions because I really felt people needed this physical component in the recovery path. And I was thriving on the 12 step spiritual path that really had helped me. I think it's miraculous. But at the same time, I 
you know, I had confusion and I'm going to say ego issues around who I was, what my body should look like, what I should be eating, you know, all the fad diets, all the crazy exercise stuff, which I didn't really have energy for because I couldn't really breathe. <laughs> so, you know, I, I was, I was just kind of in a quandary about all of that. The other thing I was in a quandary about was what I was to do for my career because, you know, I had bombed out of my job and, uh, the, the 12 steps ask you to feel your feelings. And every time I fell into going back into corporate life, I just, I felt that's not how you're supposed to feel about what you're doing to, um, for a living. Um, right. so, and I think that was a lot to do with why the, the therapist that I had was looking at that aspect of my life. Cause I had a successful corporate career in London and here I was sitting in Lake Tahoe and I was cleaning houses and bussing tables in a restaurant. So a year and a half sober, people were waiting for me to like reclaim my life. But there was a fundamental thing in there that I can really clearly see with hindsight that my first career was set up to help my mother recover. You know, uh, my success was supposed to be the medicine that would stop her going down the pathway of self-destruction through alcoholism that she was on. And I had formulated that idea from a young age, you know, maybe around 13 years old, that if I could succeed at school and get a degree and go on to become a professional, that that would contribute to my mother being happier. Right. And so it, it took to the early 30s for me to drop that idea. And it's kind that's, of funny. That's because... pretty young, actually. That's, that's pretty young. <laughs> <laughs> it me a lot longer than that to drop yeah. some of those. <laughs> Yeah, so it was, I, I mean, it was a big, it was a big factor of my like continuous awakening mm -hmm. in, in the 12 step program, this work that we do, uh, that I could really see that I, I never really done any of that stuff for me. I had this externalized motive that it was going to help someone else. And so therefore I could never really go back to it. And, you know, when I talk to people in yoga recovery, I, I often mention that because this this who we are and what we do will become a big part of um, the recovery path. You know, even for, especially from the expectation of other people. Like I meet, I meet a lot of people that kind of want to get off of the, the chosen track for them. And they might want to do something like a little um, pushing the envelope kind of thing, you know, maybe going into something like Ayurveda and yoga and um, they don't really know how to do it. Um, I think more, more and more these days, there's a path for that too. But back, this was 2001 when I was having these conversations. And I actually always remember um, the man who's now my husband said to me when he discovered, you know, that I was going to do this study Ayurveda. He said, well, how are you going to make a living? That was his first question. And I said, and this was just, it just came out of my mouth. I don't know how I'm going to make an, a living, but I know my living will be improved. Right. And, and that was really what I was looking for. I had, I had read this book early in recovery that was called The Dark Night of Recovery. And it's by Edward Baer. Um, so it's an anonymous book, obviously. Mm -hmm. But he talked about that, that recovery is my livelihood. The rest is how I just make, the rest is just how I make a living. That's, right. And I had read that in my first year. And that was really powerful to me because because there was this inner expectation that I would go back and pick up this career. And, you know, certainly it paid me money, but it didn't, it didn't really feed my soul. And here, here I was doing this spiritual recovery path. And so I could never really manage to have them sit together and say, oh yeah, that's the way I should proceed is to go back. So recovery for me has been such a life changer. Like I've moved continent, right. <laughs> I've moved career. And, you know, it's moved me into a path of discovery that's just been, um, you know, there's been a security in that because I, there, there's nothing that I need to do other than don't drink or drug or smoke today. Mm -hmm. So there's a baseline to, me, to my life and work. And then because of that baseline, because of that foundation, I feel like I can soar with right. these Vedic sciences that I was given. And one of the other things that I wrote down in early recovery was that I wanted a job that I never wanted to retire from. 
Right. So, you know, and I stopped calling it a job. I said I wanted to have work that I never wanted to retire from. Mm-hmm. And I got it because this, this is it. This is what I do. And, um, you know, formulating yoga for recovery from there, it was really like a stop smoking program. Um, but it was really, you know, because I went in to study the life sciences of yoga and Ayurveda, it's a help with self-destructive addictive behavior. So you had 12 steps, which were a fairly good fit, not everything you were looking for. And Mm -hmm. you stopped drinking and doing drugs and stopped smoking. And you got involved with yoga and Ayurveda. And so are all of those three elements part of Yoga for Recovery? Can you talk about the program, what it is that are the foundations of the program? Yeah, what are the foundations of the program of Yoga of Recovery? Um, you know, the, the one thing I was taught and trained with in um, Ayurveda is to not to treat the symptoms, but to get to the roots of the condition. Mm-hmm. Um, So from that um, mission, we have something called the six tenets of yoga recovery. So that's that's where we look at what are the roots of the addictive self-destructive behaviors. And we come up with six tenets, which are life is longing, life is prana, vital life force, life is relationship, life is sweet, life is love, and life is progress. And then each of those tenants, they're pointing to the yoga that allows us to use the inherent energy that we have in a more conscious way. And so the other thing about yoga recovery was I was really aware, and I heard people say it all the time, that once my 12-step friends began to know that I did yoga, they would come up to me and say, oh, yoga is so interesting, but I can't do it. And I've never been much of a pretzel yogi, like a bendy, flexible type. Um, my um, teacher at the ashram always jokes that we're going to take pictures of me doing asana um, because you know, that I'm not the one that can you know, immediately put their head on their um, yeah. feet or something. So, but what it felt like to me was always... It was all, it always felt good physically, but it really, it brought me to a level in my kind of emotional um, stress state that was relaxed, that was okay. And there was never really an explanation for that. But the other thing was, is that I was really aware that yoga was more about meditation, really. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted yoga of recovery to be there for people who say they can't do yoga. So to this day, I have people saying, um, you know, I, I'm kind of interested in your retreat and can I come because I don't do yoga? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you, you can definitely come. It's okay that you don't do yoga because, right. again, the media image of yoga is this almost like extreme uh, bendy types, you know, and all difficult postures. So that was another thing that I really wanted to represent. And the, what, I, what my lineage is a, a integrated system of yoga. So we have the different paths of yoga to do with service and devotion and, you know, disciplined practice and inquiry. Right. So those things are represented when we say the roots of the behavior are here. So the roots of the behavior are that we are seeking. And then those yogas resolve that seeking by giving us practices, but really giving us our uh, an allowance for the inner self that is trying to express itself in a more conscious, creative, um, authentic way. And so therefore, that's what yoga recovery is mostly about from the yoga perspective. And of course, when I was listening to um, the first person I heard speak about Ayurveda, the first thing that really, really got me about that was the constitutional model. So in Ayurveda, people um, have a unique constitution and it's described as a a certain balance of the elements of air fire water the five elements including ether and earth as well and then it's it's given to us as what we call the biological forces of the doshas so we will refer to people as a vata type or a pitta type and when i first heard that in ayurveda i really really recognized that and i had a very profound relation to that as a description of who I was 
So I, I could really recognize myself in the description of the dosha types. And that to me was like, it was a major key in the door because before then I had the inherent sense of a faulty self, no. you know, this person who couldn't, like I had habits that I didn't want to have. I didn't seem to have like the self-control or the willpower, you know, all those things that we come up against in active addiction, all that sort of like guilt and shame and feeling, um, you know, like that self-loathing when we can't show up for who we want to be. And then I really felt Ayurveda was describing who I was. And what it did was it not just described that problematic aspect of my character, but it described a way to reach a more stable um, manifestation of a more, um, the more internal me that, you know, I had these good intentions, but I could never really kind of fully manifest them. So I felt because the constitutional model recognized me, that it would be really helpful for me to investigate that. And then the second talk that I heard was from Mark Halpern, and he talked about Ayurveda's view of the cause of disease. Okay, and, so before we, before we get into that, mm -hmm. let's back up and maybe you could talk about the doshas. Mm -hmm. And because um, I'm sure there'll be some people who aren't familiar with them. Yeah. And how in particular they relate to addiction. So if someone is kapha pitta, for instance, how, how does that kind of work in terms of healing from addiction and, and in terms of your doshas as well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my recognition of the dosha types to start with was um, she was describing the three doshas, the vata, pitta and kapha. So they come across as a particular look in the body. So the actual structure of the body looks a certain way if it's dominated by air or fire or water. So this explains the different um, body types. So some people being um, thinner, some people being more stout, some people being warmer, some people being colder. Um, the, the look of the skin, the eyes, the hair, the bones, everything. And so what I had at that point was I, I could really see myself in the fire type. And one of the reasons that you might know your dosha type, because the, the body is kind of like a car that you drive. If, if your car is working, you're, you're not really paying that much attention to it. It's when your body doesn't work well that you, you draw your attention into, okay, so what's going wrong with this? Like if you're driving your car and the gas light comes on, that gets mm -hmm. your attention. So what would get your attention from the dosha types is when they stop working that well. So on a functional level, as well as, as well as a structural level, these doshas come through in how the body looks and how it functions. So also it affects the type of um, tendency people have in the mind. So if something goes wrong in my life, I immediately go towards being irritated about it. So my, my stress response is that um, I'm irritated about this. I get impatient. Something needs to change. I need to fix this, you know, become more efficient, more organized. All right, so that's and the pitch of the fire element. That's, that's the fire yeah. element type. Now, that same event might happen to my friend who's more of an air type. And then her response might be she goes towards anxiety. So she feels sort of scattered by that, not knowing what to do, more anxious, more worried about things. And so I had seen a lot of this in 12-step program, you know, because we're all sitting there in the character defects, as 12-steps um, call it. So someone might have that much more of a response, the anxiety response. Now, that wasn't me. I had the irritated response, but that didn't make me better than the person that's anxious. Because right. it's, it's, it's still a response that is coming from the imbalance of the mind-body system. Right. And then we say for the water type, a water has a certain, it's a different quality from fire and air. So the way that they would respond to the same situation may be that they would get quiet and sort of withdraw. So they, they become maybe not so... Um, not so worried, not so angry, but more of a um, quiet withdrawal. Um, uh, like stagnant kind of. Yeah, uh -huh. you know, like becoming, 
becoming not coming out to play type of thing like with mm -hmm. withholding even they don't speak much they'll get quieter and quieter the more things are stressing them so that really really fascinated me because i could see that then that mind system is affecting the body so the function of the body so Ayurveda really, really works from the, the primary aspect of us as a functioning digestive organism. So when you can see there's imbalance, the first place you can see it is an appetite, digestion, and elimination. So the gut is affected. And the, the, the way the different gut types are affected is that the air types, they tend to go into uh, volatility around their appetite. They kind of forget to eat and then they suddenly remember and they're starving hungry. Um, the, the fire types tend to really emphasize food. They feel hungry more often and they're looking for food. They feel hungry a lot of the time, even after they've eaten, they still feel hungry. And then the water types kind of, they will go to food just as a kind of source of comfort. So they will eat even although the appetite might not be there, but like food becomes like their ally, their friend for this lonely cut off feeling that stress is causing in them. So mm -hmm. they may withdraw, they may withdraw into eating, you know. So different types, different responses, function starts to become different. The air types go into this, like feeling bloated and they have gas problems, they have constipation problems. Whereas the fire types move more towards like acidity or reflux. And they might have a problem where they're waking up at night with heat. And, you know, their bowel movements might become more regular, but more loose, mm -hmm. uh, even towards diarrhea, perhaps. And then the, the water types tend to become congested. So they kind of have a heavy, sleepy type of feeling. Um, they, they become almost like exercise resistant because they're dealing with like more, we would say mud, more phlegm, more congestion in the body. So we know them to be the less active of the types to start with, but as their metabolism starts to work in relation to the stress response that they might be showing, which is the kapha, the water response, then what you've got is this congested heavy feeling. So again, for me, hearing this for the first time about Ayurveda, I was already putting that together. Like I was tired, but I was trying to fix the tiredness with the coffee and the coffee was having a horrible effect on my intestinal system. And it would sort of leave me even more tired um, <laughs> because it was interfering with the absorption of the food that I was eating. And then I also just, I really, really had a, a kind of sugar fascination you know when i was in early recovery so uh, underneath most of that was this tiredness and in in the yoga of recovery when i say life is prana that second tenant that's what that's about we say that we're, we're not only seeking like our own spiritual nature but we are seeking to feel vital and alive whilst we're here and embodied so there's a there's a lot of seeking around um, what we call the prana state. So we say that you could be tired or wired or in pain or stressed. And those pranic states are leading to coping mechanisms of stimulation, sedation. Um, what did I say? Self-medication and instant gratification. And everybody's doing that to a certain extent in our society. And then, you know, it depends what you're turning to and how often you're turning to it when be that becomes, is that an addiction? And this has got to do with, for some of us, this has got to do with the, like the cross addictions, the underlying addictions that are part of this. And so very early in my recovery, having been gifted with this glimpse into the Vedic science of life, which is Ayurveda, I thought, okay, here's the bridge. Here's the bridge that I need to cross over from a pathological addicted state into a spiritual, realized, enlightened, awakened, um, whatever you want to use as that language. You know, someone that can peacefully self-initiate practices and meditation and a, a, a sense of serenity and equanimity in life. So that was the bridge for me was the Ayurveda. It was like still to this day, and it's 
17 years since the date when I found Ayurveda. I, I, I study it, I read it, I work with really gifted Ayurvedic teachers and there's life always has something to reveal to you. It's just this beautiful science, which it's elemental. You know, we're seeing everything in the universe according to Ayurveda is these five elements. So you can, you can begin to become the, the, the player within this field of five elements and you begin to understand the interconnection and interaction. And it's pretty simple. Like I mentioned earlier, this ability to have like, is this hot or this cold? Is this heavy? Is this light? Like these are really principles that you can work with. And like for me at the time, I was considering becoming a nutritionist and I, I didn't go down that path because one of the things that I heard that Ayurveda talked about was that all food that we eat is five elements and we know the food from the taste of the food. So there's six tastes. There's sweet, sour, salty, pungent, astringent, and bitter. And that to me, like to, to this day, I think about that and I think there it is. There is intelligence because that intelligence can't be anywhere outside of you. And, you know, you watch children eat and they know what they want to eat without ever listening to the diet experts and the nutritional experts and what's the superfoods and, you know, all of that stuff. And I was really confused about that in early recovery. I knew that I, I had too much of a desire uh, for sugar, mm -hmm. you know, I, but I didn't really know what I could eat. And not everything that people told me was good for me made me feel good. For right. instance... You know, people tell you to drink orange juice for your breakfast because it's full of vitamin C. Now, as a fire type, I would drink that and I'd have this kind of acidic burning feeling. And I'd think, well, that's a healthy food. Why, why is it not feeling good for me? And mm -hmm. I could take something that was less healthy and feel better with it. Mm -hmm. And all that is, is that the, the citrus, citrus fruits tend to be a little bit more acidic. I already have a fire type of system. So... I don't need more acidity. And so therefore that was as simple as it was, but back in the old mind of mine, I actually thought, Oh my God, my go goodness, I'm never going to get healthy because healthy things make me feel worse. <laughs> well, and you know, what's coming to mind as you're speaking about this too, is how 17 years ago, there was really not a lot of knowing that trauma is underlying addiction and that trauma is stored in the body and needs to be worked through the body. And so here you are working on this deep level in the body with Ayurveda, mm -hmm. but not just the body, also on that deeper spiritual level as well. Yeah. So what are your, your perceptions of that? It's, do you think people are kind of catching up? Um, what, what are you, what are your, what do you experience in terms of that? Yeah, what do, what do I experience? Firstly, some of the things that I was doing around recovery, um, the trauma stuff was being worked out in me without me consciously looking for trauma stuff to be worked out. Mm -hmm. So I remember being, I was in early recovery and I was working with an acupuncturist and I was on the table and he'd left me with a couple of needles and my foot bounced off the table like a, a channel cleared yeah. and it, it made the whole leg move. And, and I was lying there just breathing and relaxing. And like my, my whole leg jumped off the table and I thought, well, there was an energy blockage that's now been opened. So acupuncture adds these things. Mm -hmm. In yoga class, I would be in certain postures where I would just have tears coming down the side of my face. Now there wasn't a story attaching to that. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, as we do yoga, we're, we're really working with this inner system of prana, the vital life force, which is what we're seeing as the channeling in these meridians or nadis. And so as you put yourself into those postures, you create a certain amount of pressure. And then when you release it, the flow happens again. So I had these things, for me, often it was in sitting forward bend, which they call the, the posture of surrender. Right. I would be in that posture, almost fighting with myself. And then some tears come and sometimes in a twist, the tears would come. And so one of the things that I really, 
um, I really remember about those instances was it didn't come with a story. It was just like there was the body was releasing something and, and I didn't know what. And, and then my, my teacher is very clear that when the body releases something, just let it go. Don't right. chase it down. Don't try and attach a story to it. And then don't keep repeating it to people like this happened or that happened. Um, so I think the funny thing with trauma is we, we tend to think it's something to do with a story that you can tell. Whereas I think a lot of the stuff that is trauma is like it is subconscious. Right. And subconscious works not so much through intellect, you know, so the talk therapy hasn't really reached those parts. It has to be the somatic work. And then in yoga recovery, we also really emphasize what we call bhakti yoga. Mm. And bhakti yoga is the, the idea of the emotions and allowing the emotions to be more free, to be expressing whatever emotion is coming up, but also not targeting it towards other humans, but targeting the, the feeling. You know, we say channeling the feelings towards some form of um, chosen divinity that appeals to your heart, that makes you feel safe and secure within yourself. So for some people, they call that God. For other people, they might just have some, some idea of inner consciousness or, you know, like I'm talking about energy. So some people use the chakra system, um, you, whatever it is, but, you know, knowing that there's that kind of safe, safe place within you that you can do this work. So in yoga recovery, we often talk about when we're working, the, doing the work we do by bringing in the breath, the body, the bhakti, then there's these, there's these pathways for these things now to be expressed and you don't have to run after them and regurgitate the story that you want to attach to them. If then from an Ayurveda point of view, I've also transformed my life and my health in general through the detoxification, purification practice of Ayurveda that is Panchakarma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Panchakarma is a strange word, but pancha means five and karma means actions. And so in this ancient healing system, they use five actions to detoxify the body, mostly through the intestines. So you know, this idea of taking treatments, being aware that there is toxins in there and that we eliminate them through this process. And it's like a deeply healing, loving system of care that reverses out the cause of disease. Now that's generally seen to be a physical thing, but it's also to do with emotions. So we have this word AMA, A-M-A, and AMA is the, the residue of toxins left behind by faulty digestion. And then when we say digestion, most people think of, I'm putting food in my mouth, I'm eating. And that's one part of it. It's a big part of it. But we also talk about the digestion of your life experiences, the sense, um, the sense, it, uh, the sense things that you brought in through your sight, your, the sound. Your so the whole, the, yeah. Uh -huh, yeah, the sense um, experiences that we've had, have we been able to digest them? And so trauma has a lot to do with AMA at the emotional level. So there's undigested life experiences there at the, the mind body system that has to do with things in, from our emotional life. So there, there is um, part of the Panchakarma process is these massages. And so the, they're massaging the body and, you know, in a kind of, more of a passive way than the pranayama and the yoga practice that you you are getting into those issues that are in the tissues type of thing mm -hmm. and and that's that's a pretty amazing thing to go through as well so you know most people would tell you i had a problem with my lungs for instance and if you see any holistic healer they'll tell you oh problem with your lungs that's to do with grief yeah and you know how how can i explain that to anyone that yeah, okay, so my father died when I was five and I became asthmatic when I was seven. And we'd already been moved from America into Scotland. Um, so like, I didn't have the intellectual capacity to process what was happening in my life. 
Right. And so at that point, I was taking on some of that emotional armor. And after all these years of doing both yoga, pranayama, the asana practice, the panchakarmas, that now I don't have asthma. I'm off of asthma medication that the Western doctors told me I would be on for the rest of my life. In saying that, I still have a, what I call a weak space in the body that is my lungs. So yeah. any stress or any like becoming run down, that's the first place I feel it. So again, that's been really so helpful to me that I've been able to purify and work out some of these things that were both physical and emotional toxic residues from life events that is not the fault of anyone else. It's just how things have gone down. And, you know, I get to reprocess that. And what I, what I really like about the yoga and Ayurveda path is it, there isn't just one size that fits all. Like right. the work that I'm doing now at 17 years sober or 18 years sober, I think I am, is different from the work that I did, but I'm still pulling from the same system. And I'm, I'm still using 12 steps. I'm, I'm definitely in the yoga and Ayurveda world. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of like the gift that keeps on giving. Right. And in, it, the, in no way do I find it repetitive or boring because it's this life science. It just meets you where you are and it offers this like creative pathway which I, I, I just, I'm in love with it. And um, so that's why I offer yoga recovery because people come in and do the retreats with me and we get to share that love, which is, you know, love has to be part of the healing process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and Ayurveda will love you back to health. <laughs> <laughs> True. It's such a practical science. You have this kind of a format of looking at all of the elements and how they interact and Mm -hmm. how we fit into that and what the remedy could be at any given time. Yeah. So if you take, um, I know there's no such thing as a normal addict, but if you take kind of a common experience with addiction, we've got underlying trauma we haven't dealt with. We might have years of alcohol or drug abuse. Our system is really dysregulated. Mm -hmm. So what would be a pathway in for someone who's like that? And perhaps not really willing or able or have the capacity to really work with their emotions yet. It's just too scary to go from their head yeah. to their body. Yeah. So um, one, of my, one of my understandings about this is that when you have a person that's you know, just coming out of like the, the behaviors that have been holding, holding them in place, that there's two main paths that will help them. So one is the path of the Hatha yoga practices. So show up at a yoga class and it can be any yoga class and do what the instructor's asking you to do in that simple way of moving the limbs mm -hmm. in coordination with the breath and according to your own ability. So of course, one must look at all the different types of yoga styles that are out there these days. But actually allowing yourself that like, you can tune in online to some yoga classes and set yourself 10 minutes to go through that. Because as soon as you move the body, you're activating that intelligence of the pranic life system that is living you. Right. And you don't have to give this a, a lot of thought, you know, to put your arm up, to move it this way, to do this. And it doesn't take a lot of stretching or... Um, you know, athletic ability either. I taught once in a, um, in a 12 step retreat and I taught a very simple yoga class. And then the next year I went to the same retreat and this woman came to me and said, Oh, Hey, do you remember me from last year? I took your class and I didn't remember her from last year. And I thought, I, I don't know. I don't know that I've ever seen you before. And she said, well, maybe you don't recognize me because I lost a hundred pounds in weight and she said she'd come to that yoga class and I had her lying and she moved her right leg. You know, I said, raise your right leg up as far as you can have it and then exhale and bring it back down to the floor. And she said in that moment, she remembered what it was like to move freely in her body. Uh, from and something you... happened then that she said, I'm going to drop um, all the food that I eat that impairs free movement in my body. And so she said she didn't diet. She just ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And she prepared the food. And the food was fresh food, not processed, packaged, or 
from um, fast food joints. And she lost a hundred pounds in a year doing that. And she said it was all from that memory of moving freely. So that prana, that life force that is living us, get to know it through the, pra the pranayama and asana practice. And that can really be simple. We can have you lying down on the floor and just bring your awareness to the breath and that can shift things for you. And then from there, you've just, you can go and go and go into becoming like a beautiful Hatha yoga practitioner where you can, you can impress people with your, your headstand or your handstands as most of us like to do. And I often look at that part, part of the Hatha yoga and remember how, how much it relates to being free in your body. You know, just being free to move, you know, to, to move your foot or stomp your foot or move, move, move. You know, so I think any therapy that moves the body, even if it's Tai Chi, even if it's like dancing, something where you move the body, mm -hmm. um, it's good to integrate the breath. And then the other thing that is amazing to shift the, the initial like hold and fog of addiction is service work just show up and say, I'd like to help. And, you know, in 12 steps, they really emphasize this both in early recovery and continuous recovery. But the aspect of service, you know, we have people come into our yoga place and we involve them in their community by making them an integral part of what needs to be done that day for everyone to get on better. So karma yoga, the yoga of service, just showing up to help in some way, like to put your effort in. That is, that is the main point of being able to let go of some of the things that are holding you in your repetitive, self-destructive pattern. So well, it's, and then it's, you have that, that community and that connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. which we also and it's amazing because everyone is of use, but sometimes we've forgotten that, you know, because we may have tried something and we failed at that. So we think we're failing at everything, you know, that black or white thinking. Mm -hmm. And so when you just show up and you, you lend a hand, then you're with other people who are just trying to lend a hand as well. And you really, you really drop something of like that ego um, dominance of the system with its idea of control and perfection. And, you know, this, this idea of, succeed and fail you know the the thing that we're trapped in in a competitive material society so karma yoga is one of the best heart purification practices that there are to show up and just be with other people and like you say it gives you the community and the community is such a needed aspect that would also be in the top three so like move the body move the breath help someone be in service and then be in company mm -hmm. it's, it's not rocket science <laughs> that's true well and you know what i find is that often people are so um kind of immersed in shame or mm -hmm. or that they're so distressed they've had so many years of just feeling so terrible about themselves that to, to, it's a radical suggestion to say be of service to somebody because they mm -hmm. might not feel that they're of any worth at all. Yeah. Uh huh. Hmm. So I mean, it, it, again, it's the way that we say it. Um, the you know what people think service is. If if we if we were really true about what service is, um, that it's us showing up to help help each other and the uh, the the thing that's getting done is an aside to right. how we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I have learned in like the, the spiritual path of yoga, that it's not the thing that you're doing, it's the intention and it's the ability to sort of show up and do something that you don't know how to do or that's beneath you mm -hmm. or, you know, that there's so, there's so many parts to that. I mean, I've, I've learned so many lessons about it, but um, like what it really comes down to is just being able to be in the action that you're taking right at that moment, because most of us are not in the current action. We're in the result that will come from that action. Right. And then once you have that appointment with the future and the results, then you're bound to be disappointed. So it's bringing you back into action in the present moment. 
And there's something about that that's just, it really shows you something about yourself. Again, we could go back to the dosha types and you can see what they attach to action. So I can, I can often joke with the, the people on my retreats because when we send them to do karma yoga, like washing up the dishes and things, then, you know, they come back and we say, did you learn something about yourself? And, you know, a lot of them will say, well, I was the best person there. I did the, I did the, bish the dishes the best. You know, there, there could be a more effective, efficient system. Okay. And then we can say, well, then you're talking from your aspect of fire. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, that's what fire people do. They immediately go in and want to make everything a little bit more efficient, a little bit more fast, you know. Whereas the water types will be there and they'll be getting the life story from someone that's standing beside them and really getting into a relationship role with them. And so like they're, they're finding out about who their community is by doing that. And then the air types are there and, you know, they're usually meeting everyone, being fascinated by everyone, thinking, oh my, I want to stay here for a year because all these people have all these like amazing things that they could teach me. I'm interested in all of this. Right. So the action awakens, even if it is like this entrenched personality, but it awakens that it reminds us that we are people of action, you know, that the yoga itself tells you what it's about because we would say in Ayurveda that a lot of the diseases of addiction are karmic in nature. You know, mm. that we've come into this, it's like a spiritual cause of the disease. And so therefore only action can reverse out that. And by action, we get to know who we are. And so that helps us understand the way we trip ourselves up with our own expectations. Well, and that's a really strong antidote to being caught up in thought all the time, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very I think I love the 12 step saying of um, you can't think your way into right action, but you can act your way into right thinking. Yes. And that's, that to me is one of the summaries of what service and karma yoga is about. Mm -hmm. That you, you just show up and you do what you can, and then you see everybody's doing what they can. And someone might be able to do more than you and that person is willing to help you learn how to do something. Mm -hmm. And so I watch young people in the, the retreat places that I work in just really come into a sense of self and confidence and, you know, a, a sense of offering, um, like just turning around, some, telling someone else how to fill a sink and put dishwater in it and or how to make, like, I love this, how to make soy milk or rice milk and things, that, which I always thought you just bought at the store. Right. But, you know, these young kids at 18 and 25 are showing me, this is how you do it. It's really easy. I'm like, wow, you guys are amazing. <laughs> so and they, they really build a sense of self and a sense of confidence through that, which is really nice, especially that a lot of our service work is about feeding people and making the space clean and nice to do our practice in. Mm -hmm. So we all, we all benefit from it equally. Right. right. So it's, it's a really nice thing. And that's what in yoga recovery, I have chosen to offer them mostly from pretty well established um, spiritual retreat centers. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's an embedded part of the thing is that we're all equal and we all help in our own way. Um, right. And so th there's something about that that stops this hierarchy feeling, you know? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, they feel part of, and that's exactly what we want to get away from is that isolating shame feeling. Right. So yeah. that those are the things that we would say recommend. Right. Near the beginning, you talked a little bit about ego. You just referred to ego. Would you be interested in talking a little bit about your journey with ego? And in particular, I'm interested in the spiritual depth of yoga and maybe even the spiritual um, practice in the 12 steps, whatever you might want to say about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's such an enormous subject around the ego subject, but it is at the core of it all. Um, every day I think of this from the yoga perspective that um, – the, the, the fundamental belief is that we are all one consciousness, that we are all whole and perfect as we are. And what we see played out with all these diseases and psychological troubles is the manifestation of the, you know, the, 
the thought patterns of the mind and the sense of separation that comes from our ego process. And one of the things I love about Ayurveda is that it says ego is a process. It's not a thing. It's every time you attach the I, I am, and I am female, I am this age, I am this nationality, I am this role that I'm playing. Every time you attach that and um, identify yourself too strongly with any of those, you're going to get into problems because they are not your true nature. So the, the thing that yoga talks about is these uh, afflictions, which is kind of interesting that it almost rhymes with addictions. Right. But the, uh, the afflictions of being um, the, the idea of ignorance of your true nature, the wholeness and perfect true self that you are. And so from there, moving into what I like, I'm going to run to and identify with. And then what I've identified that I don't like, I'm going to run away from. So I'm going to react and resist and run away from these things even retaliate if you accuse me of being that. Um, and then alongside that, we have this idea that, that our life is going to expire as such. So we cling to the mind-body system, the thing that is changing, and we want to have that as eternal and perfect and unchanging, which is our nature, but is not the nature of the mind-body system. So the whole of yoga says there is this witnessing capacity from the true self, and it is the one that witnesses these changes, both the positive and the negative. And so yoga constantly wants us to stand steady in that nature. And so that's, that's a, um, one of my favorite definitions of addiction is medicating our sense of self separation. So this, this sense of separation, anything that we do when we're over-identified as the separate ego self, then we'll use anything to distract ourselves from the pain of the suffering that is the separate self, that stress. But you, yoga says that's an illusion. So I, I get to play with that every day. I think it's funny because I was talking to a friend today, and this is one of my things. I... I let my hair go gray. And so sometimes when people meet me with my husband, they've asked if it's my son. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and so there's nothing more damaging to your ego <laughs> than that. It happens when we were in Thailand together and it happens um, when we were in Vietnam together. And now, you know, we're going to India in December. So I'm thinking, I know it's going to happen there too. <laughs> and so, you know, when you're standing there and that's when you really become aware of your ego because we say in yoga, not this body, not this mind. Right. And right. so what you really notice how attached you are to the body-mind system when someone says something like that. Um, and, you know, I have it too. Like, I work with a sponsor and she'll gently remind me that I'm operating from a character defect. And again, like my my sense of self at the ego level is, heart or you know like wants to get into rationalization or justification of why I need to be like this and so it's that constant process of lessening my grip on that and for me it's also about the roles that I play you know so the the different roles that we play being someone's partner or parents or you know daughter son employee boss teacher all of those you have to play those roles as best you can but also not attach too much to that idea right because most of these things are so unsteady and yet we put our whole sense of self into them and so therefore we have to constantly find something that we can identify with that's more stable and steady and what i've used in my life really is I kind of talked about this earlier on that a stability point for me is that I today will do what I need to do so I get through the day without using drugs, alcohol, or cigarettes. Yeah. And so it 17, 18 years of sobriety now, that's, that's not the fundamental focus, but it was in the early days. Right. So then the, the other thing that I get to, and I say play with is 
I, I do love the system of yoga. So it says I am this unlimited, unbounded awareness, but I have a tendency to lock myself down into identification with the externals. And so I kind of use that as a playground for myself where I, I see how attached I am to it. So maybe I'll say, okay, I am not that entirely. How does that feel? And so then I go into the feeling state of me being a thing or not being a thing, like having a glass or the glass being broken and who can be okay with those states. And so that's, that's my playground these days, which is, which is interesting when you feel into it. And that really is feeling into the body and right. using, using these tools of Ayurveda, like does that feel heavy? or tight or constricted? Does that feel tingling, expansive? You know, um, does it feel numb? Does it feel heavy? All of those things. So I get to internalize what, I think a lot of people use Ayurveda as this externalized thing, that like these qualities, okay, popcorn as a food is light and yams are heavy, but mm -hmm. like, what does it actually feel like embodying those qualities? So that's my playground, quality playground. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Well, and it's re you reminded me of the woman who, who moved her right leg and then made those huge changes just with that exploration mm -hmm. of freedom mm -hmm. in her body, remembering yeah. freedom. Because the prana has all the intelligence and it knows it's in flow. You know, flow, flow is the state of prana and then from flow you can bring it to a certain stabilized stillness mm -hmm. but that's very different from heavy stagnant oh and, yeah you know, we know this we know this from our own sense capacity and so if we can bring our senses to sense into the sensations in the body especially where the mind is creating those blocks or tensions or obstructions then we can feel into that and we often say that the the, the fear acronym so it's you know, flip everything and run. And in yoga recovery work, we say fear. The, the positive aspect is to feel everything and respond. Mm -hmm. so really feeling into it. Right, right. And that just takes a minute or two. Mm -hmm. and, and we're getting back to the somat somatic. Somatic, in yeah. The body, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. So what I'd like to finish with is if someone is new to recovery or just wanting to go into recovery, what would you suggest would be a few things that they might start with? So someone's new in recovery, what would you or, start with? Or maybe even just starting to think about going into recovery. Where would they start? Mm. So I would talk from what all I know, which is my personal experience. I find so much value in the 12 step programs because they are more available than any other system and they're free. And there's maybe 10 to 20 to 40 people in the room. And so your chances of being able to hear something that moves you or that you relate to is great like rather than a one one on one having to pick the right professional and pay over that type of money although i i would encourage anyone to go into like mental health care licensed professional practice too and do some of the deeper more intimate work with people like that and then you know just go to a yoga class and um it look in your local newspaper and see who's got some, if it's not yoga, some movement class. Um, and I, I'm, I'm saying the 12 step program because that is my personal experience, but I also present in um, conferences called multiple pathways to recovery. And there are excellent people in the other group peer, peer support recovery groups like um, Life Ring and um, Smart Recovery and all the other different groups that are now available. And I think the first thing to do is really just to pick up the phone and speak to someone. Right. So maybe before you can actually walk out the door and be ready to show up in a, a room full of strangers, like maybe get online to a summit like this, um, mm -hmm. which you've already done, 
um, find some meetings online and pick up the phone and talk to someone. Like my friend works for the Samaritans and I remember calling the Samaritans when I was younger because I was just beside myself and didn't really know what to do. I didn't think I was suicidal. I just needed to talk to someone. Mm -hmm. So even things like that, you don't have to be suicidal to call helplines like that. Right. And as you begin to speak it, you will release a lot of the um, suppressed emotional um, congestion just by speaking it. And that's totally anonymous and you don't yet have to leave the house. But if you can let the words escape, you know, and say a few things that need to be said that you could really, you could really change the energy that's been holding you down. And um, know that we people who are on the path of recovery, that we hold you in our hearts and in our prayers, because, you know, we know what it's like to have been there. You know, I personally could never, ever say my name's Kathy and I'm an alcoholic. You know, it was like impossible for me to say it because I was in that deep addiction denial system, but I knew it in my heart of hearts. And mm -hmm. then as soon as I said it, that was all that needed to happen because, you know, I sobbed, everything was released and something happened just in the seeing of it. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. So how would people get a hold of you? What's your website address? Is that the best way? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the website address is yogaofrecovery.com. Mm -hmm. And then my email is durga, D-U-R-G-A, at yogaofrecovery.com. And that's how, that's how to find me. You can, you can look on there and see where I'm teaching. I'll be in Florida um, in September and again in October. Uh, uh, Panchakarma. So for those people who have established sobriety, that if you are interested in repairing metabolism, you can contact me and see if you want to come and do a, a deeper detox three, four weeks in India. It's, it's an amazing retreat we do over there. And then I'm in the Bahamas in Virginia and California every year. Um, doing different offerings of the yoga recovery retreats and everyone's welcome to those. We ask that people have 90 days continuous sobriety because we're not, on, we're not a medical or detox facility. Right. So you have to have a certain amount of stability. But um, so, you know, come and join us and it's, it's, it's fun. It's beautiful places. And we, we really have a lot of things to, to offer you that you can really step into that being and person that you're that you intend to be oh that's wonderful well thank you so much it's been great talking with you and thank you thanks for work um, in the killaby center because uh again i love the i love the claiming of what is now you know not futurizing the the um better feelings you know like working in the present in the now and embodying it and this conversation just gets better and better every year of this 21st century. It does. So thanks for, thanks for being there for everyone and uh, inviting me to be part of. It means a lot to me. Well, thank you very much. Go to KillabyCenter.com, Radical Recovery Summit, for access to the interviews. You can watch them free online or you could purchase an all-access pass. KillabyCenter.com.